Thank you all uh, very much. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in Warsaw. I'd like to start by apologizing because I am one of nature's fast speakers. And as I began this day in London at quarter to four in the morning, I have consumed enough coffee to kill a rhino. And so there is every chance that I will begin to speak very quickly. And in deference especially to the brave simultaneous translator who is attempting to translate me now, I would urge you to tell me to slow down when and if I begin to speak too quickly. So like many of you, uh, I earn my living uh, on the internet these days. Uh, like some of you, I earn my living from the creative arts on the internet these days. And even if you're not earning your living from the internet online today, like, it's very likely that you soon will be because everything we do today involves the internet and everything we do tomorrow will require the internet. And um, one of the most wonderful things about earning a living from your creative labor is just how diverse each creator's income is. When you look closely at how different successful people in the arts earn their living, one thing becomes clear, and it's that none of them are really doing the same thing or getting their money from the same place or working in the same way. But there's a, a damnable corollary to that, a kind of problem with that, which is that this means that there's no systematic way to approach the subject. If you set out to earn a living in the arts, there is no easy path that you can take that maximizes your chances of getting that living. In fact, nearly everyone who's ever set out to earn a living in the arts has not only failed to make money, they have lost money. And this is true independent of your medium. It was true before the internet. It will likely be true when whatever comes after the internet comes along. And will almost certainly be true until we pass a law that says, if you call yourself an artist, we'll pay you until you stop. So a living in the creative arts is a kind of statistical anomaly, a bit of a Six Sigma event. And as a thought experiment, imagine that you had a firing line of millions of people all lined up, tossing coins. Some of those coins would come up heads. Some of those coins would come up tails. But if enough people flipped enough coins for enough time, some of those coins would land on their edge. And that's what a Six Sigma event looks like, something that's so rare, it's a statistical outlier. And if you gather together all the people whose coins had landed on edge and you look closely at them, you would discover that although flipping your coin more, putting effort into it, and paying attention to how you flip your coin was loosely correlated with getting the coin to land on edge, that the thing that everyone whose coin landed on edge had in common with one another was luck. Because mostly, the thing that they shared in common was that the wind and physics and gravity lined up for them. And the more chances you take, the better your chances of that happening. But at the end of the day, all the success is really down to luck. Now, imagine that flipping a coin was not just something that you did because you enjoyed standing on the firing line flipping a coin, but it was something that was built into the human condition, something that we did innately, something that was incredibly satisfying. And that people who got their coins to land on the edge, those people were on the fronts of magazines. They were fated. They were uh, characterized as geniuses and uh, great movers of their age uh, and uh, um, uh, considered to have had great virtue for, ha for having made their coin land on edge and were inspirations to generations of coin flippers to come, well, there would be a lot of people lining up to flip their coins. And this really is the arts, right? Art is something that we do innately. Tiny babies make art as soon as children can talk, as soon as they can hold a pencil. They sing, they draw, they tell stories. It's built into who we are. People with horrible psychiatric problems, people with PTSD, we send them to art therapy because making art heals our soul. So it's no wonder that we are very concerned with how to learn a living in the arts. Now, when we talk about the internet and the arts, we tend to focus on which business models serve artists the best. But I think that's quite backwards. Um, there are so many people pursuing the arts at any given moment that whatever artistic business model history is selecting for, our technological moment is selecting for, that channel will be filled 
with all the art that you could ever consume of every kind and every virtue because there are so many of us who want to enter the coin flipping contest. So for example, prior to the advent of the, song, of the, the phonogram, the sound recording, and its cousin, the radio, there was no such thing in the public mind as a performing singer who was a wonderful performer but didn't like to perform in front of other people. Right? That kind of artist was as weird before the advent of a way to reach your audience without being in the presence of your audience. That idea was as weird as a champion swimmer who didn't like to get wet. Right? It was a contradiction in terms. And the moment at which the phonogram and the radio appeared, sorry, I was wondering what you were all watching back there, and then I realized it was me. Um, <laughs> the moment at which the phonogram and the radio appeared, uh, there was a, a, a titanic moral panic about whether or not it was real art. John Philip Sousa, the great American composer, went to the American Congress and said, if these infernal talking machines are allowed to continue, America will lose its voice boxes as we lost our tails when we came down out of the trees. <laughs> and who could blame the performers of the day for suggesting that performers who had never had a look in, performers who had never had any artistic validity, performers who by definition had never moved anyone, had never changed their lives, had never been culture heroes of their age, that these performers would come in to fill the role that, the, that, they had, that they had filled for all the time, that they had been the way that music reached the public. When we defend business models, we not only privilege yesterday's lottery winners at the expense of tomorrow's lottery winners, but we also go to war against the social, technical, and political factors that have changed which business models work. The radio's primary impact was not on who got to sing and where. The radio's primary impact is still being rippled through all of our society, and it was a revolutionary change in how the world talked to itself. And when you make war on the new business model, you make war on the technology that's coming up from it. Now, I happen to be one of last year's lottery winners. I happen to be someone who's earned my living in the creative arts for now going on two decades. And I happen to be someone who's hoping that in the decades to come, I will continue to earn my living. And so I'm keenly attuned to the question of how artists will earn their living. But I think that the right way to pursue that is not to try and force, foreclose on one business model or another, or enable one business model or another, but instead to ensure that whatever business models are generating money, that the bulk of the money that they're generating is going to the creators who make the work that we love, secondarily to the organizations that invest in them, and finally to the platforms that bring their works to the audiences. And I think, unfortunately, we have fall, failed completely to make policies that attain that goal in the information age. Now, this talk is structured around three ideas, my, my three laws. They started as one law. I gave a talk at a publishing conference in New York. And uh, I live in London, and so when I speak in America, my talks are often a bit hallucinatory. There's this moment of, of jet lag at 2 in the morning when I realize I'm not going to get to sleep. So I might as well just wake up and work on my speech. And I came up with this law at 2 in the morning at a hotel room in New York. And afterwards, I went and saw my agent for lunch, because that's what you do in New York. You get a free lunch from your agent. And, uh, <laughs> I said to him, his name is Russell Galen, and I said, Russ, I came up with a law today, and they liked it. And he said, if there's one thing I learned, now you have to understand, Russ has uh, had some very big clients, but one of his biggest was uh, the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, whom he represented when he was alive and now whose estate he represents. And he said, if there's one thing I learned from working for Arthur, it's that you can't have one law, you have to have three. So I have three laws, and I'm going to present them to you. Now, the first law, the law I came up with in New York, was anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you and won't give you the key, that lock isn't there for your benefit. Now, if you've ever taken your creative work and put it into one of the platforms, put it into Google or Amazon or any of the other ways that your work can reach your audience, you may have seen a little tick box there that says, would you like to protect your work 
maybe, would you like to protect it from piracy or from unauthorized use? And I think most people, when asked that question, would you like to protect your work? The obvious answer is yes, right? And if you haven't done it on your own, if you work with one of the investor organizations, like a record label or a publisher or a film studio or a game studio, chances are when they uploaded your work, they ticked that box for you. Now, what does that box do? What that box does is it adds a digital lock to your work, what's called digital rights management. And that lock is supposed to limit how the people who use your work are allowed to use it. And the way that it works is this. You scramble the document before you send it to someone. So I've got a movie, I want you to see it. I scramble it first. I encrypt it. I use encryption technologies that are understood to be good, to be effective, that date back to um, uh, some of the most critical inventions of the second half of the 20th century, in particular, the work of Alan Turing and the Polish mathematicians at Bletchley Park in their work on cryptography. And I encrypt it in such a way that unless you have the key, there's no way you'll ever be able to watch it because we live in an age of miracles. We live in an age where for the first time in human history, anyone, anyone who can afford a computer that fits in your pocket can encrypt a message so thoroughly that not only can the police not read it, not only can the Secret Service not read it, but if every hydrogen atom in the universe were turned into a computer that labored with every moment there was between now and the universe's heat death, no one, none of them would be able to decrypt it without you. So it seems very secure. I've sent you this message and I've encrypted it. And then I send you a program that can decrypt this movie that has the key to decrypt the movie hidden in it. And that program has rules about what you're allowed to do with it. Like maybe you're not allowed to save the movie to your hard drive so that it can be read without my special program. Or maybe you're only allowed to watch it once or on Wednesdays or inside the EU or not inside the EU. And so long as the only way you can descramble that movie is using that program, then the system would work very well. But that's not what actually happens. What actually happens is that the thing that scrambles and descrambles your, this movie that I've given you, it has the keys in it. And I gave it to you. And I'm trying to stop you from using the keys without my permission. But I just gave them to you. Right, do you see the problem here? I've just given you the keys that I don't trust you not to use. Now, maybe you don't know where to look in the program to find the key. Maybe I don't know where to look in the program to find the key. But someone somewhere in the world knows where to look in the program to find the key because the people who are attacking the system don't just include you and me, but also board grad students with the weekend off and their own electron tunneling microscope. So inevitably, in the space of hours, these keys emerge into the public domain, and with them players that allow you to do anything. So um, it has failed completely to stop people from making unauthorized uses, but the laws that we passed to protect these digital locks are, um, uh, contain uh, codicils or elements that go further than just saying, if there's a digital lock, you're not allowed to break it. The laws like the European Union Copyright Directive of 2001, the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, you may have seen the DMCA, it's the most popular uh, video author on YouTube. This video is not available because of a claim under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that, that DMCA. Or in Canada, Bill C-11, uh, a bill that was embarrassingly passed in 2012. And the thing that's so embarrassing about it for me as a Canadian is it's one thing to be stupid about the internet in 1998, or even 2001, but to have not figured out that the internet really matters by 2011 is just felony stupid. Um, under the DMCA, under the EUCD, under Bill C-11, it's illegal to um, uh, uh, unlock that lock uh, unless you're the person who put it on the uh, work in the first place. So if you sell a book to Amazon and you tick the lock my book to the Kindle box, then no one except Amazon can unlock that book from the Kindle. It is chained to the Kindle forever. Now, so long as you and Amazon are getting along all right, that's great. But if you and Amazon should fall out, then only Amazon can release your customers to follow you 
to another platform, to somewhere else where your books might be for sale. Now, this is not a hypothetical example. This is something that's happening right now here today. Hachette is one of the big five publishers in the world. There's really only five big publishers left. Two of them are German. One's owned by an old newspaper family. One is owned by a company that mostly makes cluster bombs and has a, a, a sideline in publishing. <laughs> this is the French one, uh, Hachette. They also make cluster bombs, but most of their business is not making cluster bombs, unlike Bertelsmann. And Hachette, uh, you would think, as a company that specializes in materiel, would have read their Sun Tzu, would be up on their strategy and their art of war. But no, Hachette has had this ironclad law since the day ebooks emerged. No ebooks get sold by Hachette unless they have digital locks on them. And that means that every book that Hachette has ever sold has been locked to the company that sold it Amazon, um, uh, the uh, Dot Mobi people, and all the other ebook companies going back to the earliest days. Now, Hachette also happens to be the first publisher whose deal with Amazon ran out and got renewed. Amazon did 10-year deals with all the publishers about 10 years ago. And when they went to see Amazon, Amazon told them that they wanted more than they were willing to give up. We don't know exactly what that is, but it must have been a lot because Hachette said no, and Amazon said, all right then, none of your books are for sale on Amazon anymore in America. Now, under normal circumstances, in a world without this digital locks law, here's what, Amazon, here's what Hachette could do to Amazon. They could say, all right, you, of course, are under no obligation to sell our goods. It's your store. But we are going to make a little app that we're going to advertise on buses and in airports and everywhere else people read e-books. And it's going to say, Amazon won't sell you the new J.K. Rowling novel. Want to read it? Download this free app. Convert all your books to work on anyone else's platform. Google Play, Apple iBooks, Kobo, any one of them. And from now on, until Amazon to start, decides to start carrying our books again, all of our books are 50% off everywhere else. Now, you can imagine that Amazon would maybe change the way that it negotiated with Hachette if that was one of Hachette's options. But it's not, because Hachette decided to put digital locks on their works that don't stop people from pirating them. Everything in Hachette's line is available with the same number of clicks for free on a pirate website as it is for money on any of the pay websites. In fact, fewer, because no amount of clicks can buy you any of Hachette's books on Amazon right now. But what they've done is they've sold their business out to Amazon. And this is only going to get worse from here on in, because there are lots of other markets where digital lock companies own the market. Amazon has another division called Audible that sells 90% of the audiobooks in the field. Now, Amazon did not staff up Audible with all their nice, cuddly people and leave all the super competitive people in all the other divisions. The people running Audible are every bit as cutthroat, every bit as committed to the bottom line as the people running all the other Amazon divisions. And I will bet you a testicle, although not one of mine, <laughs> that Amazon is going to put the screws to the audiobook publishers in exactly the way that they've done with the ebook publishers. But it's different, because with Audible, you can't opt out of the DRM. You can only sell if you tick the DRM box on Audible. And Audible is the only supplier of audiobooks to iTunes. So if you want to sell in either of the largest digital marketplaces, you have to agree to lock your books to Amazon's platform. So that's rule number one, law number one. Anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you but won't give you the key, that lock is not for your benefit. Now on to rule number two, um, and it's this. Being famous won't make you rich but nobody will give you money for your stuff unless they know it's there. So Tim O'Reilly is this kind of uh, technology guru. He's a great speaker. He comes out with great sound bites. He coined the term Web 2.0 and open source. And a couple of years ago, he said, for most artists, the problem isn't piracy, it's obscurity. Right? I think most people who heard that said, yeah, that's a good one, Tim. And I agree. I think that's a great statement. But when you talk to people about it, you find out that what they think Tim meant was, if you are famous enough, you will be rich. This is really clearly not true. No amount of Facebook likes or whatever the equivalent is on G+, will make you rich. None of them will put 
uh, braces on your kids' teeth. Converting fame to money is a very hard alchemy. And even if you are well known and beloved by lots of people, they may never give you any money. But unless you are well known and beloved by lots of people, they absolutely will not give you any money. The way that people find out about our works and pay us for them in the 21st century is through the internet. They find out about them through social media, through search engines, through other tools, and they pay us by means of ad brokerages like Google or Kickstarters uh, and its um, uh, uh, crowdfunding platforms or through um, uh, direct payment systems like PayPal. These class of, of uh, entities, the, under copyright law, they're called intermediaries. And the more of them there are, the more competitive the marketplace is for our works, even if we are going with traditional publishers. So, sorry, let me uh, catch up with myself here. <laughs> ah, and there they all go. Sorry, I normally have a podium. Uh, Yes. Everybody laugh at the Canadian with his papers on the ground. Go ahead. Flow. Uh, there we go. Um, now, the internet has spawned numerous successes who piece together all the, publish all the functions of a publisher from pieces they found lying around out there on the internet. Um, some were artists who started out as traditionally published artists, artists with a traditional investor who then went indie, like Amanda Palmer, who went from a record label to a Kickstarter career. Some of them are artists who started out as independents and then made their way into the traditional commercial sphere. So that might be a writer like Hugh Howey, who started off self-publishing his wool stories, became a huge bestseller, and then when Simon & Schuster came to him, and asked him for, uh, if he'd be willing to let them publish his books in print, he was able to negotiate a much better deal than any other Simon & Schuster author this decade, I'm sure, because Simon & Schuster has this ironclad, no exceptions made policy that if you publish with them, you have to let them have your ebook rights for everybody except Hugh Howey. Because Hugh said, you need me a lot more than I need you. I can walk out of the room and do better with my ebooks than you can ever do for me. And so Simon and Schuster, who make no exceptions, made an exception. Or some artists who start out as indie successes stay indie, like Jonathan Colton, who got uh, his legs under him by recording and singing Creative Commons songs about programmers, and then got invited to uh, record for some of the bigs, like he wrote the theme to Portal uh, that many of you have enjoyed on Steam but now tours giving concerts and earning his living that way. Now the world of big content, the world of the entertainment industry, has been subject to the same concentration that has happened everywhere else, finance, energy, every other sector. And it's left us with five labels, four, or, uh, five publishers, four labels, and five film studios. And when there is less competition among buyers, the investors, the studios, the labels, and the publishers, there will be less money for the sellers, those of us who make the art that they're buying. And you see this in the standard contracts that they do. If you are lucky enough to sign a major record label deal, you will see that in your standard contract, regardless of which of the four bigs you go with, you will have to agree to let them deduct from your royalties every quarter a certain percentage for what's called breakage. Now, breakage is a line item on the, uh, on the standard recording deal that dates back to when uh, vinyl record albums were shipped from factories to retailers. And it represents the percentage of record albums expected to be broken this quarter on the way from the factory to the retailer. And it is deducted from your MP3 sales, right? There's a, you know, why is it deducted from your MP3 sales? Fuck you, that's why. There's four of us, that's why. If you don't like it, find someone else who'll give you a better deal, that's why. Right? That's what happens when there's less competition. As an author, the deals that are available to me get worse every year. Now, many publishers are non-negotiably acquiring ebook rights, international English rights, international translation rights, audiobook rights, and graphic novel rights. All of those are rights that historically I would have sold on my own 
and gotten separately paid for and been able to play publishers off against each other, one another. The Indie Channel represents a kind of competitor of last resort for those of us on the sell side of a world with a dwindling buy side. The worst deal that the majors can offer to us has to be better than the best deal we think we can get for ourselves if we walk out of the room. But the indies have been under assault from the entertainment industry for at least 15 years through the copyright wars. All of those people that we, that we piece together our income through, because their vast troves of material, you heard about the 100 hours of video and YouTube being uploaded every minute, their vast troves of material include some infringing material. And so they have been asked to assume greater and greater burdens on what they're allowed to, uh, to put up and under what circumstances they're allowed to put up and how much money they have to spend to get out the door to be sure they're on the right side of the law. YouTube started with two guys in a garage. It was the ultimate Silicon Valley uh, uh, er story. But to start YouTube today, to compete with YouTube today, you have to have two guys in a garage and, as we saw, a content ID system costing hundreds of millions of dollars so that you won't get sued into oblivion. Effectively, this makes YouTube the last big successful video platform that we are likely to have. And when you have a new boss who doesn't have to worry about competition, that new boss is remarkably similar to the old boss. Which is why when Google decided to go into the streaming audio business to compete with Spotify, it gathered the four record labels who are very impedance matched with being the only game in town, it gathered them in a room and it asked them what terms would be acceptable to them to allow their catalogs to be streamed over a streaming music service. And then it sent a memo to all the indie labels that make their work available through YouTube and depend on YouTube as a way to reach their audiences. And it said to them, you will take the terms that the major labels uh, struck with us or you will not be allowed to make your videos available on YouTube anymore. Carrot stick, right? When there is not much competition on the buy side, those of us on the sell side get a worse deal. So that works much better, by the way, than shuffling them to the back. Future reference there. Um, the liability accruing to people who serve as these intermediaries, who introduce our works to our audiences and get us paid for them, is only going up. I, I heard someone mention ACTA earlier. ACTA has been succeeded by a series of trade agreements, every bit as sinister and more, being negotiated in closed door meetings. Nobody ever negotiates a treaty behind closed doors if they want to do things that are likely to be popular. Right? The only reason to retreat to a smoke-filled room that the press, that governments are not allowed in, that NGOs are not allowed into, is if you're planning to do something that you know will get you into a lot of trouble and you want to present it as a fait accompli when you're done. So none of this has actually done much to slow down piracy, nor will it. Today is the hardest copying will ever be for the rest of time. November the 6th, 2014, put it in your calendars because in 25, 30 years, your grandchildren will ask you around the Christmas dinner table, tell me about 2014 when copying was hard. When you couldn't for one euro buy a thumb drive that could store all the music ever recorded, all the movies ever made, all the, all the books ever written, right? It's not like fewer people from here on in are not going to know how to type movie name space BitTorrent into the search engine of their choice. Copying is only gonna, gonna get easier from here on in. But by we artists allowing our investors to chase the indies uh, in our name, we have not stopped people from pirating our works, but we have reduced the competition among the people who are willing to pay us for them. And we've made our, our deal worse too. So law number two, um, being famous won't make you rich. But you can't get famous. You can't get rich without being famous. So this brings me to the last and most important law in the talk, the third law information doesn't want to be free. Now, you may have heard that this is a fight about whether or not information wants to be free. Uh, I've, I certainly heard that in the 10 plus years I've been working on these issues. Wherever I go, people ask me if this is about what information wants. And I decided that I was gonna get to the bottom of this last summer. So I rented a cottage in uh, the Lake District in England and I invited information up for a long weekend. And uh, we, you know, we, we built a sweat lodge, we had a sauna, 
we talked about our childhoods, we cried a little. We drank Chardonnay, uh, and when it was over, information took me in a strong, masculine hug. I smelt the wood smoke in its hair. Its stubble rasped my cheek, and it confessed to me it's one truth, what information wants from all of us. It doesn't want to be free. All information wants is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. <laughs> because information doesn't want anything, right? And if it did, who cares? Who cares what an abstraction wants? In the 21st century, in an age in which our very buildings are woven out of information, people want to be free. And the only way to make people free is with free, fair, and open information systems. So while it's true that um, some of the uh, regulations that we've come up with for the internet have been bad for the arts, when we focus on whether or not this policy or that policy makes the internet safe for this kind of art or that kind of art, we miss the picture. We assume that the role of the internet is primarily to be a glorified video on demand service. Or sometimes, if you're the secret police, you think it's a glorified jihadi recruiting service. Or maybe if you're a certain kind of blue nose, you think it's the world's best pornography distribution system. <coughs> but the internet is none of those things. I mean, it does all of those things. But what the internet is, is the nervous system of the 21st century. And everything we do today involves, excuse me, everything we do today involves the internet and everything we do tomorrow will assuredly require it. So while it's true that if you add digital locks to your works, you make a bad deal for the creators and their investors and even the people who buy those works who find themselves unduly locked to some company's uh, business model. Thank you. I don't know how I'm going to reach that while holding the papers in the mic, but if I don't kick it over, we'll call it a success. Uh, the thought is appreciated. Um, while it's true that adding these digital locks has had these negative impacts on the entertainment industry, that's not the major impact on society. You see, the rules that protect digital locks, that make it illegal to help people remove digital locks, they're so broadly written that they make it a felony to report on vulnerabilities, on flaws in the code in devices that have digital locks in them, which is increasingly all of our devices. Now, those flaws can be used to remove the digital locks. If you can find a mistake that a programmer made in creating your phone or your tablet or your, your set-top box, you can probably uh, um, leverage that flaw into a jailbreak that will let you run code of your choosing and possibly be entertained in an unauthorized way. But those flaws are also useful to attack you in every single conceivable way because these devices are woven into our laws in every single conceivable way. Your phone is not a computer you carry in your pocket that you play Angry Birds on and sometimes talk to your friends with. Your phone is a supercomputer that knows who you are, where you are, who your friends are, what you talk to them about, where you are when you talk to them, all of your secrets, how to log into your bank account, what you talk to your lawyer about. It has a camera. It has a microphone. You keep it next to you in the toilet. You keep it next to you in the bedroom. It sees your kids walking around naked in your house. Your phone is, po is capable of betraying you in every way you can imagine. And whether or not it does depends entirely on whether or not your phone has flaws in it that you know about and can, and can remediate, or flaws that are kept secret lest you figure out how to watch TV the wrong way if you discover those flaws. And we know that when flaws have been discovered in the past in devices that have a digital lock, that the initial discoverers of those are often reluctant to come forward lest they become felons. The Sony Rootkit in 2005 was a piece of uh, digital lock software shipped on 6 million CDs, 51 titles, audio CDs, that when you loaded them into your computer's optical drive, infected your computer with malicious software that changed it so that it could no longer see programs that started with a certain string. If you could find that, if, if, you, if you had a program running that began with dollar sign, SYS dollar sign, your, pro, your computer wouldn't see it in the file listings. If you asked it whether that program was running, it would tell you no. And what the Sony Rootkit did was installed a program that started with this string that watched to see whether or not uh, you were trying to rip a CD. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to make sure you didn't rip Celine Dion CDs. As a Canadian, I apologize. Um, but what they ended up doing 
was blowing a giant hole in your computer's immune system. And the researchers who discovered this didn't come forward because they thought that they would go to jail if they did, because programmers have gone to jail for pointing out these vulnerabilities. So instead, they sat on that information. And by the time it was known, 300,000 US government and military networks had been infected with the Sony rootkit. And virus writers were already adding dollar sign SYS dollar sign to the beginnings of the names of their virus files so that they would be invisible to the operating system and the antivirus software running on it. When you make a hole in something's immune system, you should not be surprised if you get, um, if you get uh, 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 opportunistic parasites rushing into that hole. Now, that was 2005, when computers were still a relatively exciting new idea, nine whole years ago. Today, we live in a world that is made out of computers. A modern building is a computer that you happen to rent time in. Right? If you take the computers out of a modern building, it ceases to know how to respirate and control its temperature, and black mold starts creeping up the walls. This is what they discovered in Florida after the economic crisis, when they foreclosed on all those houses and shut them off, and the computers could no longer regulate them, and they had to scrape them off to the ground and start over again. A car is a computer that zips you down the road at 120 kilometers an hour. And at Black Hat and CCC and DEF CON, we see attacks on cars that use their Bluetooth interface to shut down and seize control of their brakes and steering. Your planes, right? I, I just came back from a book tour in America. I flew back on a Boeing 747. A Boeing 747 is a flying Sun Solaris workstation in a very fancy aluminum case connected to some tragically badly con uh, secured SCADA controllers. And it's not just that we increasingly keep our bodies inside of computers. We increasingly keep computers inside of our bodies. So if you're my age and you grew up with a Walkman, or you're a little younger, you grew up with MP3 players, you have logged enough punishing earbud hours that there will come a day if you live long enough and aren't killed by a self-driving car first, there will come a day when you will need hearing aids. And it's vanishingly unlikely that those hearing aids will be beige, retro, analog, transistorized hearing aids. They'll be computers that go in your body. And those computers, depending on how they're designed, depending on how they're regulated, will have the power to let you hear what's there, or stop you hearing what's there, or tell someone else what you're hearing, or make you hear things that aren't there. It all depends on whether our computers are designed to say, yes, master, or I can't let you do that, Dave. This may sound like science fiction, but it's already upon us. You know, I travel a lot. I'm changing the climate. Ask me how. And the first rule of the traveler is ABC, always be charging. So the first thing I do when I come into a room is I look al along the baseboards for electrical outlets. So I was in an airport lounge once, and I had gotten the only outlet, and I was using it to charge my laptop before the flight. And a man came up and very cheekily said, can I use that? And I said, <laughs> I'm charging my laptop before the flight. And he rolled up his trouser leg and showed me the robotic prosthesis he was wearing from the knee down. And he said, I need to charge my leg before the flight. <laughs> so I let him have the electrical outlet. <laughs> Stacking the deck against disclosure of flaws in our computers in an era in which we live inside of computers and computers are inside of us, in which all of our, our, of our actions are mediated by computers, is an insane idea. And when it comes to this business of increasing liability for service providers, well, yeah, it's been a total failure in the, com in the prohibiting piracy department. You saw that there was lots more creativity than ever before. There's also lots more piracy than ever before. I mean, I think a short way of saying that is people do a lot more on the internet than ever before. All the things that they do on the internet, there's a lot more of it, and there's no end in sight. So we haven't stopped piracy by adding intermediary liability. And we have certainly reduced our ability as artists to negotiate a better deal from our publishers. But that's not the major impact of intermediary liability on the world. Right? Beyond the 0.001% of us who earn our living in the arts is everybody else who uses the internet for everything else. If YouTube is getting 100 hours of video every minute, after the first month, it's got all the commercial video ever. What's the rest of it? It's everything, right? It's, uh, a lot of it is um, stuff like, um, stuff that we can all agree is very worthy. Uh, footage from the Hong Kong Umbrella Revolution, uh, footage from Syria, footage from the ACTA protests, 
whistleblower footage. And, and of course, that stuff we all agree should be there and we all think is very important. And of course, having created systems like Content ID and their brethren that allow for a system of unaccountable censorship without adversarial judicial processes and with no penalty for misuse, we should be unsurprised that they are routinely misused, sometimes accidentally, as when uh, a news agency uploaded NASA's footage of the Curiosity landing to YouTube and claimed it so that NASA's own version of that footage was taken down from YouTube, and sometimes deliberately, as when British neo-Nazis or the Church of Scientology abused the notice and takedown system to remove stuff from the internet. Now, when you talk about how valuable all the stuff that isn't content on the internet is, you're supposed to say, there's all this worthy stuff, umbrella revolution, Syria, whistleblowers. And of course, we know that the rest of, it, the rest of it's a bit silly. It's YouTube comments and cat videos. But I'm going to speak briefly here in service of YouTube videos, YouTube comments and cat videos. Because while there is much on the internet that appears banal, I, I would put it to you that it is only banal because of the context. So when my wife comes down to breakfast every morning, I ask her how she slept. Now, I don't ask her this because I don't know. Of course I know how my wife slept. I sleep next to her. When my wife has a bad night, I know it before anyone else. Right? The reason I ask her is I have enciphered a message in the world's easiest to crack code. And that message is not, how did you sleep last night? It's, I'm thinking about you. I love you. Here we are. What's going on? You know, you and I, we're in this together. Right? Those banalities, those trivialities, if they seem like they are meaningless to you, it's because you weren't their intended audience. And every one of those momentous moments, every time we heard something like, it's not cancer, or it is cancer, or it's a boy, or it's a girl, or I got the job, or I got fired, every time we've heard something that made our hearts stutter, those momentous moments, they were all built up out of a hummus of these tiny moments, these seemingly insignificant moments. That's what our social fabric is woven from. And to say that in the service of making sure that you watch television in the way that you're told, that you read books in the way that you were supposed to, that we are willing to create a system of unaccountable censorship that can be used to attack everything else is depraved in its indifference to what society is for and what artists should be doing. So I earn my living from copyright. I, I have this weird income where I make up funny stories that help you pass the long slog from the cradle to the grave, right? And it, it may, uh, and, and I happen to believe that I can earn my living without demanding unaccountable censorship, without demanding surveillance, without demanding control. But even if I didn't, even if I thought that tomorrow I would have to go and get a real job because my coin wasn't going to land on edge anymore, I would go out and do that, rather than use my art and my creativity as the basis for adding these systems of control and surveillance to the internet. Because as much as I have dreamt since I was a tiny boy of earning my living as a science fiction writer, which is a job so weird and improbable that when you tell people you do it, it's like you just told them you paint the stripes on the bumblebees. As much as it is literally a dream come true, I would much rather bequeath a free and fair world to my daughter than go on earning my living this way. Now, there are millions of ways to earn your livings in the arts in the 21st century. And there are trillions of ways to go broke trying to earn your living in the arts in the 21st century. Ensuring that the artists who do succeed get as much of the money as is possible is a noble goal. But even more than that, artists should always be opposed to censorship and surveillance. If you ever find yourself in a policy question about the arts and the internet, ask yourself, does this add censorship and surveillance? And if the answer is yes, your answer should always be no, because that's where the arts should always be. Try anything and everything you can to get your coin to land edge on. But if you require that the internet be broken to make that happen, then you're on the wrong side of history. Now, um, it's hard to live a pure life, right? We live in a, the real world, and we make mistakes, and we make compromises all the time.
And for every vegetarian, there's a vegan. And for every vegan, there's a breatharian who insists that they get all of their nutrition from deep breathing exercises without killing so much as a plant. But in the real world, most of us muddle along as best as we can. And you, like I, almost certainly give some of your money every month to companies who've made it their mission to destroy the power of the internet to give us freedom in the service of making a few more dollars for their shareholders. Whether that's giving money to a service like Netflix that has devoted itself to destroying network neutral uh, to uh, destroying uh, open browsers by adding by insisting that DRM be added to all of our browsers or whether it's giving money to a giant cable company that has devoted itself and uses your money to lobby against the network neutrality that's so crucial or whether it's getting a fruit flavored mobile device uh, from a company like Apple that has made DRM its alpha and its omega. And I'm not going to ask you not to do these things, because the reason we do these things is that there's good movies on streaming services. And the internet is like water. We can't live without it. And Apple makes some nice devices. I used to be a CIO. I was ordering a million dollars a year of them at one point. What I'm going to ask you to do is to add up your budget, all the money that every month you give to organizations who've made it their mission to destroy the future that we want, and figure out what percentage of that you're willing to spend as a hedge to make the world better. And then pick an organization like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or the Free Software Foundation, or the Modern Poland Foundation, or Quadrature de Net, or EDRI, or CCC, or any of the other thousands of organizations that have sprung up around the world to defend freedom in the 21st century. Take a small amount. 10% is what churches say, right? Give you a tithe of 10%. Denise Cooper, who comes, goes around doing a talk like this, she asked people to match it 100%. I think that might be a little high. Somewhere in between 10 and 100, I think, is the right number for you. Maybe if we hedge our bets a little, maybe if we stick our, stand our ground, we can make a difference. Thank you.